Seth, it's great uh, to have you here. In the, you are in the center of uh, a collaborative research center on the origin and function of meta-organisms. Um, very strange title. Seems like our view on the complexity of life, on nature, has changed dramatically in the last few years. This center does lots of sequencing and discovers uh, an unexpected complexity. Yes. What's your opinion about that? If we go back a little bit, let's go back three and a half billion years ago, when the first microbial life arose, it was 100% microbial life for two to two and a half billion more years. And so the other 1% arose in a microbial soup. And they had no other choice, essentially, but to make good with the microbial world they inhabit and deal with it. Um, and you might think that the foundation of biology would be built on these kinds of observations and pillars over the last couple centuries. But in fact, this isn't the case because we've only made these insights, as you say, with the sequencing technologies of today and essentially sequencing has become the microscope of the 21st century biology. So when we talk about meta-organisms, we couldn't have talked about meta-organisms because we didn't have the technology to do it. Uh, and, and now we do. Um, so why, we're just- Why is that important? Yeah. Well, I think first it's an observation that is a grander view of life, if you will. It is, it is the recognition that no individual is an autonomous organism, but rather is complex, independent upon a community or ecosystem. And this has been eye-opening uh, because so many facets of biology have largely skipped over the microbial community because we just haven't known about it. And I'm talking about host biology in this regard. And it really took, uh, in the 70s, it took uh, pioneers like Carl Woese to open our, our, our eyes to this microbial community. Um, and uh, pioneers like Lynn Margulis to open our eyes to the dependency of life on microbial endosymbionts with our endosymbiosis theory. And so we're just, I think, scratching the surface and getting started. Uh, really, it's a 50-year history for leading us to where we are in terms of making observations about what metaorganisms are, how they function, and how do we appreciate host biology in light of this microbiome or community that associates with it? One of your major contributions is to realize that there is phylosymbiosis. What do you mean with phylosymbiosis? Yes. So phylosymbiosis is a, is a new term we, we put forth in 2013 uh, to describe essentially how evolutionary genetics of a host corresponds to the ecological community that associates with that host. And in this case, we're talking about the symbiotic microbiome that associates with that host. So phylosymbiosis was born out of the observation that when you look at microbial communities across species that are closely related, host species, you can find in some cases that their microbial community relationships recapitulate the pattern of the phylogeny of the host. In other words, you make a nuclear or mitochondrial tree of the host phylogeny, and then you look at the relationship to the microbial communities, and they parallel each other. So phylo means tribe, or clades, which is these different species that we're looking at, the host species. Symbiosis refers to the total microbial community that it associates with, and these relationships can parallel each other. Isn't that synonymous with coevolution? Good question. Uh, it is not. Uh, and it never was, in fact. Um, in fact, we proposed the term phylosymbiosis uh, as an alternative because it was not an observation that was consistent with coevolution, coadaptation, cospeciation, codivergence. There's a lot of terms out there for uh, single species or species pairs coevolving together. But phylosymbiosis was needed because this was an observation that was independent of those phenomena. Maybe part of those phenomena go into phylosymbiosis, but we simply make an observation of a pattern in which microbial community relationships recapitulate the pattern in the host phylogeny. It does not imply coevolution, as you say, or vertical inheritance. It is just a pattern. Now the task for us is to figure out 
what drives that pattern? How is that pattern assembled? Does the host control it? Do the microbes control it? What are the differential roles of transmission, vertical transmission from parents to offspring, or horizontal transmission from the environment? Let's go to another major contribution from your lab. Uh, and you are here to give a, a plenary talk tonight about the influence of microbes on speciations. That's the ultimate impact uh, an, an association can actually have in evolutionary terms. How did you get to that, and what do you mean with microbes affect speciation? So 20 years ago, I was a, a graduate student, and I was, uh, I was working on a bacteria called Wolbachia, which is a symbiont that lives inside the germline of half of the world's arthropod species. Massively common, one of the greatest infections on the planet. Um, and it had been postulated that Wolbachia can make different forms of sperm and egg. It can alter the sperm and egg in a way that prevents the sperm and egg, when they come together, to properly develop as an embryo. And it had been postulated. There was some controversial evidence that arose prior to that. So in part, inspired by the observation that maybe symbionts can affect the way sperm and egg come together, and in part thinking about Lynn Margulis's advocacy for the idea that symbiosis can be an important aspect of speciation of their hosts, um, it appeared to me that there was a challenge. We didn't quite have the right evidence yet, uh, but there was a lot of speculation. Um, so what we started to do was look at very young species of insects, in this case wasps, parasitic wasps, and we found cases where essentially in the blink of an evolutionary eye, 400,000 years ago, species carried different Wolbachia infections and when we interbred them, they could no longer mate because Wolbachia were playing around with the sperm and egg again to prevent those embryos from developing. Now, the remarkable insight was when you antibiotically cure Wolbachia from these wasps, now the species come back together and the sperm and egg fuse into a proper embryo and develops quite fine. So essentially, we cured the speciation event. We cured the reproductive problems. By removing the microbes. By removing the microbes. And this, this still is one of the best cases, I think, out there for the role of microorganisms in speciation. Um, and that's where it all started. And today, we're looking at much broader questions from not just one symbiont to the total microbial community, and how does it play a larger role in speciation across all animals, across plants as well. My colleagues here, also in this building, um, they see in the morning patients, and in the afternoon they are somewhere in a molecular lab. Yeah. What does it mean for a medical doctor of these days to realize that microbes are so important? For one thing, it's, it's so common to use uh, a culturing method to detect if somebody has an infection or not. But one of the sort of most remarkable insights that we've learned is that 99% of all microorganisms aren't culturable. So if we continue to use culturable assays in the clinic, we're only gonna be able to assay the 1% of microbes that are culturable when the vast majority is not. Um, so for one thing, it's, it's important from that perspective. But the second thing would be, if our bodies are ecosystems for microbial communities inside and out, um, and we hear a lot today about personalized medicine or personalized genomics, how does the observation that we are an ecosystem affect our thinking and our paradigms about how personalized medicine will move forward? And so currently, personalized medicine or genomics focuses on the human genome, the 20,000 or so genes in our human genome that may dictate how we digest certain drugs or whether we get predisposed to certain diseases. But there's a whole other set of genes and microorganisms that come in with the microbiome. So we're going to need a more holistic personalized medicine in which we include the microbiome and the genome as part of the way we treat people either retroactively or proactively before they get sick because there may be signals in the microbiome that could tell us if somebody's about to get sick or not. So that's very exciting uh, and completely new thinking in basic biology and in interdisciplinary comparative sciences. Yeah. But if you think of the young generation of researchers, doesn't that also open a completely new world of 
um, what to do, how to approach biomedical issues. I mean, if we now realize how important the microbes are for health and disease, um, isn't there a market for doing something by using the microbes? Absolutely. So yeah, there's a market and then there are challenges. And I think there are probably three areas for the market. One would be fecal transplants or stool transplants or microbiome transplants. Um, we see this effectively working for a gut infection called Clostridium difficile, in which patients have a cure rate of about 95% when they receive a fecal microbiota transplant from somebody who is healthy. The challenge there though is we actually don't know what the feces is doing. Uh, we know that we're transplanting an ecosystem, but we don't know which members of that ecosystem matter um, and whether it's bacteria, archaea, viruses, metabolites, et cetera. So if we're gonna boil fecal material down essentially to what its most useful components are, the challenge is we need to figure out what it is that can do that. A second area would be agriculture in which we could use a form of soil probiotics to grow crops faster, larger, produce more fruit, more vegetables, and people are working on that. It also raises the idea that we could do artificial selection for crop yield through changes in the microbial community rather than, let's say, the genetics or the genome. And this is called microbiome engineering or hologenomic evolution, if you will, which takes advantage of the fact that the microbiome can contribute to these kinds of traits. And then the final aspect uh, would be insect or vector control. And this actually strikes close to home to some of the work we do with Wolbachia. Now, Wolbachia is a in, is an infection of the insect germline, including mosquitoes that transmit dengue virus, Zika virus, chikungunya virus. And Wolbachia also can confer resistance to these viruses that occur in mosquitoes. And Wolbachia has a way to spread itself through mosquito populations. And so ongoing right now is a worldwide pilot effort to spread Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into areas that suffer from dengue Zika, chikungunya, et cetera. And the hope, if this works out, is, is that we can remarkably reduce the incidence of transmission of these viruses to humans. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting set of essentially three areas for the future. One aspect we haven't talked yet about, but which seems to me important, is how do organisms cope with changing environmental conditions? in the light of the new view that microbes are stable um, associated with organisms. In this building, we will have next spring a workshop on the meta-organism in extreme environments by inviting people from the agriculture, from the marine sciences, and um, collecting examples where it becomes obvious that microbes and the change, the exchange of microbiome under different conditions may help organisms to adapt to the new situation. What do you think about that? It makes a lot of sense, it does, because if a host organism can acquire either an acclimation phenotype or an adaptation over evolutionary time span to handle a certain environmental stress, uh, then if given enough opportunity to sample those microbes, selection will favor those kinds of associations. Um, and if it happens faster than, let's say, the mutational process inside the nuclear or mitochondrial genomes of those host organisms, then it should speed up the process of adaptation to stressful or extreme environments. Um, we see the, 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 the reverse as well, which is that climate change can actually change the microbial community, the resident beneficial or even just commensal microbial community. And when climate change affects the microbial community, those organisms can decline, right? So coral is a great example of this because it loses its symbionts under stressful conditions and therefore it turns white and it becomes dead. Um, so we need to look at it from both ends. What can the host do to adapt by acquiring it? And also what will the climate change do to changing the meta-organism in a deleterious way? Which would be more an effect of reduction of biodiversity yeah. uh, in, in this respect. Yeah. yeah, either 
the loss of diversity or loss of key symbionts that are critical to the function of that meta organism. It may only be a handful. It may be a community. We have to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, what um, astonishes me uh, is how rapid evolution has to go in some cases, and we do not have any mechanism really which explains rapid evolutionary processes. Wouldn't the exchange of microbes be a way of a rapid change or a rapid adaptation to a new method in contrast to the slow going process of sexual reproduction and producing thousands of generations? Yeah, it's, it's a complicated question. It depends on the strength of selection. Um, it depends on the rate of mutational variation in, in the organism's genome. And it also depends on how adaptable the, the organism can acquire new microbes. And so which ones happens faster? Um, which one leads to a response to selection? Uh, all of this is really needs to be theoretically grounded as well as experimentally grounded. Now, how are people doing that? So in our case, where we study speciation by a Wolbachia infection inside the germline, we were able to show that the two species that underwent a significant amount of reproductive isolation because of the Wolbachia don't have much other reproductive isolation beyond that. So they would not be considered good species if it was not for the Wolbachia symbionts inside them. So in terms of increasing the rate of speciation, this is one example, and the theory also supports this as well. Um, another example would be how fast can you select on a phenotype with just the microbiome and no change in the genome. So you can do experiments where you hold the genome constant over generations, but acquire new microbiomes through selection. And we can understand, is that a faster process than let's say the mutational process? Uh, and these will be, I think, foundational studies to understanding the, the significance of microbiome changes in response to stressors. So where you think this type of research will be in 10 years, and where you think your own research will be in 10 years? Yeah. It's, um, I think the history of, of speciation and symbiosis is following the same timeline of the history of how we're appreciating the new role of the microbiome in host biology. Um, so there's a limited amount of data, a limited amount of knowledge right now. And so we have many questions to ask that we're just scratching the surface on. So let's go back to the beginning the luminary Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin writes The Origin of Species in 1859, and he gives us a statement about how evolution works to possibly shape new species. But he doesn't really know about genes, and he doesn't really know about microbes at this point. So if you march forward 50 years from there, we have what's called the modern synthesis, which fused Darwin's theory with genetics, and so began a century-long paradigm of looking at the genetics of speciation. That is, what are the number of genes and types of genes that contribute to speciation? And today, in the last couple decades, we're just starting to ask the same questions with microbes. So what are the types of microbes that can cause speciation or be associated with it? And really, how common or universal is this pattern or is this observation? So there are probably three ways that one could go about addressing this, and I think that will be important in the future. Um, the first will be the comparative method, which is to look at a broad swath of organisms and ask, do organisms infected with a certain microbe or a microbial community, do they tend to experience higher rates of speciation than those that do not? Um, a second way would be using model systems, where we expand the tools of germ-free rearing without microbes and ask mechanistic and reductionist questions about how do microbes actually contribute to the speciation process or speciation outcomes. Uh, and then finally, I think we need uh, a theoretical set of studies to show us how, for instance, symbionts might accelerate the speciation process over or faster than the genetic-driven process of speciation. And really, it's these two things that come together that essentially might make the whole reproductive isolation that affects whether organisms interbreed or not. So a more synthetic view, I think, is also needed where we combine microbiology and genetics in studying the origin of a new animal or plant species. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.